This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. T-R-T-F-R. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com and the iHeartRadio app. We come to you once again this week from the intellectual dungeon on the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri, as we always do. And we are glad you've chosen to join us this Tuesday afternoon, wherever you may be around the world or across this, the greatest nation and the greatest culture that humanity has ever produced, the United States of America. Welcome in, everyone. And I'd uh, just like to start off this week with this. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It should go without saying, of course, that that is the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. I trust that most of you out there are familiar with it to some degree. And I bring it up, I start the program with it this week, because in light of the tragic shooting down in uh, Parkland, Florida, Broward County, Florida last week, and the ensuing yet predictable debates that have come forth regarding guns and AR-15s and the role of guns in society and should people have them, blah, 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 blah. In light of all of that, I have noticed that the Second Amendment, most of the time, either gets ignored or completely bastardized. Which is a curious thing, given that one would think, in looking at the founding of our nation, looking at our founding documents, one would think that the answers to the vexing questions that face us in light of mass shootings like this, that the answers to those questions would be found in the Second Amendment. Yet so many people are ignoring it, taking it out of context, or just completely misunderstanding it. So I did want to... uh, answer that a little bit. I wanted to turn that tide to the small extent that I could here. And I wanted to spend some time this week discussing that Second Amendment and then using that to analyze some of the arguments, analyze some of the issues we have in society going forward. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, at the risk of coming off like your junior high school English teacher, at the risk of being that dry, at the risk of replicating your junior high school English teacher's penchant for hour upon hour of diagramming sentences on a blackboard, which had to be one of the most boring things we ever did in school. Some of you, I'm sure, hated that as much as I did. At the risk of going down that road, I do think that for our understanding and to clarify our understanding and to put everything into perspective, we should break down this Second Amendment just a little bit, the wording, the verbiage, the structure of it. Don't worry, it's not going to be as droll and boring as your junior high English class was. Let's take the first phrase of that on its own. 
a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. When you look at that phrase on its own merits, you see that it is essentially a declarative statement. It's somewhat passive in its structure, in its voice. It is not a statement, it is not a phrase that is calling for any sort of action or defining any sort of action or, or any way forward. It, it's just a declarative statement. It, it's a statement that something exists. Structurally speaking, that first phrase essentially is, hey, this is a thing that exists. It would be similar to if if I came to you and I said, water being necessary to the growth of plants, rain shall fall from the sky. Now, granted, that's a very odd grammatical structure, of course. But I think you get the point. When I say that phrase, when I say something like, and I'll try to clean up the grammar for today. Um, because, because water is necessary for the growth of plants, rain shall fall from the sky. When I say that, I'm not making a judgment about the rain. I'm not saying how the rain's going to be comprised or how it's going to get here or who's going to be in charge of that or how we're going to impact the rain. I'm just saying, rain's going to fall because we got to have water to grow crops, support life, right? I'm merely making a statement of something that exists. So, when you look at that first phrase, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, that's not a phrase that defines any action or calls for any action. It doesn't say anything about how the militia will be regulated or even who will regulate it. Or any details about that, it's just making a statement that, okay, if we're going to have a secure free state, there's going to have to be a well-regulated well militia. That's all. Now, of course, as a part of that, there is some dispute, there is some disagreement at times over the specific definition of well-regulated at the time the Second Amendment was written. The Oxford English Dictionary has indicated that... Uh, at that time, well-regulated meant something more along the lines of well-functioning. So you could say if, if someone was healthy and they had a healthy appetite, you'd say they had a well-regulated appetite. Or if a clock kept good time and didn't, didn't lose time, it would say it was a well-regulated clock. So in that sense, well-regulated may have meant something a little bit different in those days than it does now. But even setting that aside... The phrase itself, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, is one that is passive and declarative in its form. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Declarative statement. If we're going to have a free state, we're going to have to have a well-regulated militia. Basically like saying, hey, the sky is blue. There's no real controversy over that. There's no real call to action there. Okay, so going to the rest of the Second Amendment then. Now that we've established that if we're going to have a free state, a well-regulated militia is going to be part of that. Having established that, let's go to the rest of the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now this is where it gets interesting to me as I break this down and I analyze it. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is the part of the Second Amendment that actually does refer to action or calling to action, that sort of thing. The first part of the, first part of the Second Amendment basically says, okay, this is something that exists. The second part of the Second Amendment says, given that it exists, here's how we're going to react. In other words... Because a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, I find it very interesting 
Then in the second part of that phrase, they use the word people instead of the word militia. One of the mischaracterizations you constantly get from the American left whenever something like this comes up is the idea that, well, in those days, the militia was comprised of just the regular people, and so this really only meant, the Second Amendment really only meant weapons in, in times of war being, being carried by people who were in the militia and who were serving. It's a gross mischaracterization. While it is true that the militia was and is comprised of people being drawn from the general population, I find it very interesting that they use the two words differently there. In other words, because they use militia in that first phrase and people in the second phrase, it casts a lot of doubt in my mind whether or not the founders actually were talking about the same thing. If not, why wouldn't they have said a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the militia to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? That would have made more sense if the liberal interpretation of the Second Amendment is to be, be believed, but that's not what they wrote. And at the risk of splitting hairs here, I think back to my high school years and a dear old social studies teacher I had named Mrs. Kleinlein. She's passed away and gone to the great classroom in the sky now. But she was the teacher we had that taught us the United States Constitution. And one of the activities she did during that week or two that we were studying the Constitution, one of the activities she did was every day when we got into class, we had a pop quiz. We had to close the books, uh, close our notebooks, put them under the desk, and only have a sheet of paper and a pencil on the desk, right? And this pop quiz consisted of one question and one question only. And we did this every day for about a week and a half. The pop quiz we would have at the start of the period was that we would have to write out the preamble of the United States Constitution. That was our pop quiz. And then you turn that in. Now, when she graded this, she graded it in a very interesting way. If there was any mistake whatsoever in that preamble that you wrote, if you misspelled a word, if you had a word out of place, if you forgot a piece of punctuation, if you put a period in where there should be a comma, anything like that, no matter how small, if you made one mistake, you got a zero on the pop quiz. Either you got it perfect or you got a zero. Nothing. Zilch. Nada. F. There was literally no room for error on the pop quiz. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, this is kind of harsh. This is, this is kind of draconian. I mean, I, I got to do it perfect or I get a zero. But as I got older, I, I finally understood. It finally dawned on me the lesson that Mrs. Kleinlein was teaching all of us. The lesson was that everything that is in the Constitution, every word that is used, every piece of punctuation, everything you see in the Constitution is there by design. It is supposed to be there. It was intended to be there. And likewise, everything that is not in the Constitution is not supposed to be there. In a very active way, it was sort of teaching the originalist view of the Constitution. And I'm, I'm grateful to her for doing that when I was in school. So with that in mind, with that understanding in mind, that, that's why it's so interesting to me that the word militia is used in the, first, in the first phrase of the Second Amendment, but the word people is used in the second phrase. Was that just something that was overlooked? Was that just something that was used for, for style? No, I don't think it was, because you see, there is a historical aspect to all of this which I've not heard anybody talk about in any of these debates or, or arguments in the wake of Parkland. We don't often talk about the ratification process for the United States Constitution. It may have been briefly touched on when you were in school in history class, but I doubt 
I doubt you spend a great deal of time on it. And even when we discuss history today, it's something that rarely comes up. But if you look back at the history of the whole thing, the ratification of the United States Constitution was not a slam dunk. It's not like the founders wrote this Constitution and presented it to the states, and the states said, cool, we're on board of it, let's go. That, that didn't happen. Instead, when the Constitution was written, it was then presented to the states, and each state had a convention where they would determine whether or not they ratified that Constitution. And through that process, a lot of states had various questions, concerns, clarifications they would like to have that were then sent back before they would ratify it. Now, without going into a long and drawn-out discussion of the whole thing, the bottom line is that those questions and concerns and clarifications that the individual states felt they needed in order to ratify the Constitution, those were addressed in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, which of course includes the second amendment. In other words, without the Bill of Rights, without those first ten amendments, there would not have been enough states to ratify the Constitution for it to have been put into effect. And speaking specifically of the Second Amendment, that was a key amendment to bring forth constitutional ratification. Because you see, one of the key criticisms questions, concerns that the states had with the Constitution as, as originally written was the concept that this new centralized government that was being put forth, this federal government, would have a standing army. Now, for you and I, sitting in 2018, it probably seems odd to us to think that a nation could exist without having a standing army, but that's not the, that, that's not the understanding of the time. You've got to realize that these people who were determining whether or not their state would ratify the Constitution, that these people had lived through the Revolution. These people had lived through a time where King George and England had used a standing army to enforce tyranny. It wasn't something that was abstract to them. It wasn't something that was a, well, we better be careful because this might happen sort of situation. No, they lived it, they saw it, they survived it. And to a lot of them, they were very leery about getting into any situation that could potentially bring that about again. Understandably so, right? So what has been overlooked oftentimes in history, even forgotten in some quarters, is that the Second Amendment was designed as a compromise for that concern. Without it, there were states that would not have ratified the Constitution because of the existence of a standing army. They did not want this... Uh, newfound federal government to use that standing army to roll over their own people, just as England had tried to do. So the Second Amendment was a compromise. The Second Amendment was put forth so that it would be ensured that, any, that a standing army put forth by this government and the government itself would be held in check because the people would be armed and the people would be armed with the same type of weaponry that that standing army had. So in other words, an out-of-control federal government could not use a standing army to enforce tyranny on the people if the people themselves were armed sufficiently as the standing army was. Man, that's key. That's important. That's the cornerstone around which the, the Second Amendment came about. 
That's the cornerstone around which our gun rights today are built. And this isn't just my partisan interpretation of it all. Let's consider the words of some of the founding fathers, some of the important people who were around at the time of ratification. James Madison in the Federal, Fed, eh, Federalist Papers, if I can speak today, James Madison in the Federalist Papers said this, Americans have the right and advantage of being armed, unlike the citizens of other countries whose governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. George Mason, who co-authored the Second Amendment, speaking to the Virginia Convention to ratify the Constitution. In other words, he's the one taking the Constitution to, to this convention to say, hey, are we going to ratify this or not? These are George Mason's words. I ask, sir, what is the militia? It is the whole people. To disarm the people is the best and most effectual way to enslave them. So you see the Second Amendment was a compromise to make sure the people could never be enslaved. Noah Webster said, Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every country in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword, because the whole body of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops. So when I take that into account, and I look at that phrasing, and I look at the fact that the word people was used in that second second phrase, where the word militia was used in the first phrase, it all starts to fit together. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the, to the security of a free state, a declarative statement, saying that if we're going to have a free state, there's going to have to be a well-regulated militia. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That second phrase being a counterbalance, a check and balance, a counter on that first statement. That the people and their arms are a counter to the possibility of tyranny in a standing army coming from a central government. And yet in all of the debates and discussion this week, I haven't heard that mentioned at all. Now, some of you are saying, hey, wait, a nut job shot up a school. What does, what does keeping tyranny in check have to do with any of that? Well, on the face of it, I can see your point. But where it comes into play is when we have a tragedy like this, and instantly we see people, mainly on the American left, talking about banning certain types of firearms, particularly AR-15s and AK-47s and so-called assault weapons. Almost immediately, that, that rhetoric came down, right? You've heard it, I've heard it. In amongst that, we've heard liberals argue, well, these are weapons of war. These are military-grade weapons. They further make the argument that civilians must not be allowed to procure weapons of war or military-grade weapons. Now, I'm going to leave out the debate over whether or not an AR-15 meets the, meets the uh, definition of a military-grade weapon or a weapon of war or not. Frankly, I can see arguments on both sides of it, but to me that's just a semantic thing and it doesn't really matter. The point is, we're hearing liberals argue about weapons of war and military-grade weapons being in the hands of civilians as though that's something that should be avoided. Go back and read the Second Amendment within the context of the time it was put, it was put out and you'll see that it was intended! It was intended! For civilians to have so-called weapons of war and military-grade weapons. That was the point. That's why we have a Second Amendment. 
without the military-grade weapons and the weapons of war and whatever other distinctions you want to make, then how can we possibly be secure against the very concept of a centralized government? I mean, let's face it, our founding fathers understood that any kind of centralized government, no matter how well-run, well-intended, or the quality of the people involved in it, any centralized government being put into place automatically undertook a risk. The people automatically took a risk by allowing a centralized government to come forth because the possibility is always opened up. They'd get a little bit too big for their britches, and they'd try to run over the people and enslave them again. And boy, do we see do we see examples of that today with the FBI trying to steal a presidential election. They knew that. And they knew we needed a counterbalance to it, hence the Second Amendment, and hence, yes, the reason that we need AR-15s and AK-47s and whatever else. The idea that civilians should not have access to weapons of war or military-grade weaponry is a complete antithesis to not only the intentions of the founders, but the complete antithesis to what America was founded on to begin with. We'll be back with more right after the break here on Truth Frequency Radio. Bye. 